Hello, everybody. I hope you had a good break and we are ready to continue the afternoon sessions with the next one having three talks that are going to be chaired by Ed Emot, who is a tenure track fellow at uh, Liverpool University. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow for a couple of years in, in my lab. Uh, he came with proteomics, proteomics experience and he came with passion for single cell proteomics experience. So Ed, without saying anything further, uh, I would let you uh, take on the session and chair it. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, so I'm assuming that the audience knows who Nikolai is at this point, but I'll give a brief introduction anyway. Um, so Nikolai is an assistant professor at Northeastern University and his lab is interested in post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. Now, work you probably won't hear so much of um, involves studying novel methods for gene expression regulation, such as specialized ribosomes. But what we'll be hearing about today is the lab's work on developing methods for performing and analyzing single cell proteomics data. The lab started on this in 2017 with the release of the original Scope MS manuscript. And then last summer, it released an updated version of this method, Scope 2. And Nikolai is now going to be talking about some of the experimental design considerations and trade offs you may have to make depending on your particular experimental question. So thank you, Nikolai. Thank you, Ed. Uh, today I'm going to share with you our ideas and analysis on two uh, strongly related topics. One is how we can balance different priorities in single cell protein analysis, namely accuracy of quantification, number of proteins analyzed, number of single cells analyzed. And the other highly related topic is what we can learn that is complementary and different from analyzing the RNA and the protein content of individual cells. And one of the underlying themes that is going to come over and over again in my presentation will be the significance of the number of copies that are analyzed from either messenger RNAs or proteins. Now, to motivate uh, the need for having methods with different uh, capabilities in terms of optimizing different priorities, I'd like to start with this introductory slide on applications of single cell analysis. As Sunny Shi pointed out this morning, one of the most frequent applications these days is to analyze single cells so that we can cluster cells based on their cell type or cell state and build various single cell atlases. And this application demands that we are able to analyze large number of single cells, and we are able ideally to quantify a very large number of molecules, RNAs or proteins. And the accuracy of quantification is highly desirable, but it is less crucial than for another application shown here to the right, which is building more mechanistic quantitative models to understand how biological systems process information and give rise to various phenotypes. And these different applications, uh, emphasizing different priorities, are best approached with different methods. And in the case of single cell RNA sequencing, we have many methods whose analysis and trade-offs are well enough understood, so it's worthwhile giving uh, an example with them here. Uh, in particular, different methods have different capture efficiency, meaning fraction of messenger RNA molecules that will be detected. And one set of methods known as SmartSeq, shown here with yellow, has high capture efficiency, which results in large number of genes being detected and relatively low missing data, as you can see here to the right. Another set of methods, the droplet-based methods, which here are exemplified with drop sick, have lower capture efficiency. They detect fewer messenger RNAs per cell, and they have much more missing data. And if you look at this slide alone, just at these data, you may conclude that everybody is using smart sick, 
And that will be an incorrect inference because SmartSeq is relatively low throughput and expensive, while the droplet methods are high throughput and inexpensive. And this advantage has made dropped, uh, droplet methods the preferred set of techniques used by the majority of people doing single cell RNA sequencing. They have, begun the they have become the basis of 10x genomics, which has grown to a market capitalization of over $10 billion based on methods with lower capture efficiency. Uh, and again, in this case, my point is not to say that one method is better than another, but that these trade-offs here are important in terms of the downstream applications. And the efficiency of detection, which is dear to my heart, and I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about improving it, is not the only consideration or the number of messenger RNAs proteins that are being detected. Now, let's go back to single cell mass spectrometry and look at the challenges and the trade-offs that we might have there if we wanted to analyze a single cell uh, via LCMSMS. And in fact, we have done that. Many of you have done that. And in this case, I will simplify the challenges with a beautiful data set from the group of Ryan Kelly. And that, in that data set, uh, Kong and colleagues analyzed samples that were comprised either of individual cells shown here to the left or a sample, a sample comprised of 100 cells. And you can see that even when they analyzed an individual cell, they were able to detect tens of thousands of peptide-like features. And they were able to analyze over 10,000 peptide-like features at the MS2 level in the, in the samples comprised of individual cells. That's pretty good. And these uh, results are actually not hugely different from the results obtained with a 100 cell sample. The big difference emerges when you look at the fraction of these peptide-like features to which we can assign confident peptide sequence. This is very challenging to do with single cell uh, level peptides and easier to do with 100 cells. Uh, and many of you probably can immediately see the connection to the preceding talk with DAA analysis, where again, the libraries, the DAA libraries and the peptide identification was a major uh, step that was still under development. And we have done very similar experiments in my group. Uh, they have been done by Harrison Specht and Gray Huffman, and we see exactly the same results qualitatively that the limiting challenging step is assigning confident peptide sequences to tens of thousands of, of analyzed uh, peptide-like features. But in this case, I chose to illustrate it with the data from the Kelly lab because it gives me another opportunity to reiterate the importance and the emphasis that they place on reanalyzing each other's data. I think if we want to be a collaborative and productive community, we should learn how to do that effectively and constructively. And this is a wonderful data set that illustrates the point. The point that peptide sequence identification is difficult. Uh, you can also see it actually even more quantitatively if you look at the fractional increase in peptide-like features being detected or analyzed between one and 100 cells, there is a significant increase, but the increase in sequence assignment is even larger. So to improve peptide sequence assignment, we introduced the concept of isobaric carrier that many of you are familiar with, but I'll take just a minute to emphasize some of the important points because it also frames uh, the, the following discussion and data that uh, I'll show. Uh, so in this approach, we label peptides from small samples such as individual mammalian cells with isobaric mass tags. And in addition to the small samples, we label a carrier sample that can be comprised of different number of cells, usually larger, like 100 cells or 200 cells can be labeled. And once uh, these peptides are labeled, they can be combined and analyzed by LCMSMS. 
And here you can see three important uh, layers of the analysis that are influenced by the introduction of the isobaric carrier. One is the ability to detect precursor ions. And as I showed you in the previous slide, this is not a rate limiting step for the analysis. While precursor identification is enhanced, that is not necessary because even without isobaric carrier, we can already detect tens of thousands of peptide-like features and analyze a very large number of them. But the isobaric carrier also affects potentially the quantification in the single cells, which happens based on the reporter eyes, and importantly affects peptide identification because many of the peptide fragments that uh, we see in MS2 spectra will be contributed by uh, the isobaric carrier, and that is why it is helpful. But there can be a trade-off between those two steps of number of peptides identified and those quantified. And the importance of this trade-off has become increasingly apparent as the idea has been enthusiastically taken up by the community and applied in many different labs throughout the world. And this trade-off is the focus of the next few slides that I'd like to share with you. Now, first, let's consider theoretically what that trade-off is. As we start increasing the number of cells in the isobaric carrier, we are going to increasingly deliver larger and larger number of peptide fragments through the MS2 analysis, and therefore we are going to identify the peptide sequence with high and higher probability, high and higher confidence. At some point, uh, so around here in this theoretical example, uh, we begin to reach the capacity of the mass analyzer that we have set. In this case, that's not a hard limit, but something that we set as a parameter. And then we begin to accumulate ions for less and less time that is required to reach that limit. And you can begin to see this decrease in ion accumulation times. And because ions are accumulated for shorter and shorter period, we see less and less signal from the single cell peptides or from the small sample peptides. And that means we count less and less copies and we can make more and more statistical errors in estimating the abundance of the lowly abundant samples. Um, the upside, and that's an important upside, is that as we make the accumulation times shorter, we can analyze more and more peptides and we can identify many more peptides and proteins. So in this case, it's a trade-off uh, as, as shown here in terms of the accuracy and the, the extent to which peptides are sampled from the single cells and the number of peptides that are identified across the sample. And we can easily change the limit for accumulating ions in the orbit trap as shown here with these red curves. And you see that while the shapes are qualitatively identical, there is a significant shift. In particular, if we allow to accumulate more ions in the orbit trap, we begin to see the saturation at the higher level and we begin to see the decrease in fuel times or accumulation times and single cell peptide sampling later for larger carriers. So this is the theory. Let's see what, what's the data. And the data in this case are generated by Harrison Speck. Uh, he made scope sets that had different size um, carrier, isobaric carriers, ranging from 10 cells to over a thousand cells. And in this case, we show just data from a hundred to a thousand cells because we wanted to intersect all the peptides and to condition on everything that might complicate the analysis. And you can see that just as expected uh, from theory, the ions delivered to MS2 analysis increases as we increase the size of the carriers. And this is particularly prominent when we have a high target for accumulating ions in the orbit trap. And this increase in the peptide fragment ions results in more and more confident peptide identifications. That's good, that's simple. Larger carriers increase the ability to determine peptide sequences. Now, what's the effect on quantification? 
Uh, you can see that with the blue data series here, where we have artificially limited the target number of ions that we accumulate in the orbit trap, as accumulation times decrease, the signal derived from the single cells also decreases. But with the red series, you don't see that decrease, not nearly as much, and you don't see it because in this case, we we have the or we can accumulate ions for the entire time allowed without reaching the limit of the orbit trap detector in this case 300 milliseconds so based on these data we can make a couple of very simple conclusions one is that the isobaric carrier may indirectly suppress the single cell signal i say indirectly because in this case the suppression is really a function of the parameters that we have chosen to set if we set the higher orbit trap target, the red distribution, that suppression is uh, very small or none at all. But on the other hand, if we wanted to run the instrument faster, analyze more peptides, increase number of proteins identified, then we are in the blue regime where we are going to be able to do all of these things, but at the expense of sampling fewer copies from the peptides originating from single cells. And in none of these cases, the isobaric carrier is boosting the signal derived from single cells. Uh, so it is important to pay attention to how much ions we accumulate from the single cells to support reliable quantification. And let's look at quantification because abundance of signal intensity is really indirect proxy for accuracy of quantification. If we look at the quantification, we see by comparing to external standards or looking at the consistency of quantifying the same protein from different peptides originating from that protein, we see that when we have the, law, the high uh, field target for the org drug detector, the quantification accuracy is not very much affected by increasing the size of the carrier. Very simple to understand. That's exactly what theory would predict. And we see a decrease uh, with the small field target because by design, we have chosen parameters to decrease the sampling of copies from the single cells. But this effect is actually average, what I'm showing here for all peptides on the left. We can choose a subset of peptides that are well sampled, even with the lower field target. And then we see that they're well quantified. And that brings me to an important point that I think it's important to try to have benchmarks for the accuracy of quantification on a per protein basis rather than on a per sample or per cell basis because in this case you see a direct example how some proteins are not quantified well because the choice of parameters, not the isobaric area, the choice of parameters has decreased their sampling efficiency while other proteins are much less affected by um, by this. So the other question is the reliability of quantification. Uh, in this case is um, what, what they have shown so far only decreases with certain set of parameters, but what if we want to increase it? What if we want it to go the other way? And the obvious thing to do is to increase our sampling of peptides, how many copies we detect per single cell uh, protein. And we can easily increase it by increasing the time over which we accumulate these ions, which is what um, uh, Gray Huffman has done in this case. And you can see that as Gray increases accumulation times, the correlation to uh, external benchmark standards also increases. And so does, so does the internal reliability of the data. So going back here to this, uh, slide that motivated the discussion of the trade-offs and the size of the isobaric carrier. I think that there are different parameter sets that might be optimal for different types of analysis. Uh, a particular group might want to uh, emphasize the accuracy of quantification and increase accumulation times. Another group may simply want to quantify more proteins and run the instrument faster and choose a blue set of parameters. And either of those might be reasonable and profitable, uh, but one has to understand what are the inherent trade-offs 
uh, and what is the price that we pay for being able to quantify more proteins or what is the price that we pay if we wanted to quantify less abundant proteins so that can decrease the, the throughput. And, and that, in my mind, gives the power of the method because it makes it suitable for a wider range of applications. There is no need that we should have only one set of parameters that is optimal for every application. And with that, I'd like to switch to the second topic of, uh, my, of the discussion today, which is the degree to which RNA sequencing and single cell mass spectrometry are complementary and help us learn different things about the biology of the cells. In this case, the biology of the cells is macrophage polarization. As many of you know, macrophages are uh, innate immune cells, resident immune cells present in most of our tissues, and they display tremendous amount of diversity, both in terms of their molecular makeup and their phenotypes, in particular their inflammatory or pro-inflammatory functions. And the experiment that we did was to start with a monocytic cell line and differentiate it to macrophages. Then we took the cells, both monocytes and macrophages, we sorted them using uh, a fax sorter and we analyzed them either by scope two or by uh, 10x genomics, which is uh, a commercial method for single cell RNA sequencing. And I'm not going to explain in details the scope two uh, workflow as we already talked about it earlier today and we have tried to uh, to describe it as well as we can via all of these websites and protocols highlighted here. But I want to highlight a new resource that Harrison Specht just made available um, recently as he gave a very popular webinar and was bombarded with more questions than he could possibly answer. So Harrison uh, took all of these questions that he couldn't answer and turned them into a blog post with uh, detailed answers. So. If you have question about scope two, there's a good chance that you might be able to find it at Harrison's blog post uh, from this address here from his website. From the very beginning, we were motivated by the possibility to quantify proteins in single cells, not detect them. Detection can be very useful, uh, but our own interest has always lied more on the side of quantification. And in particular, Harrison and I speculated early on in a JPR perspective that because proteins are so much more abundant than messenger RNAs, we should be able to sample a larger number of copies per protein than we can sample per messenger RNA and therefore achieve more accurate quantification than what is possible with single cell RNA sequencing. But we didn't know how to evaluate uh, and this hypothesis because we didn't know how to count the number of ions in the orbitraps. <clears throat> and then we thought a lot and asked around and to our rescue came Alexander Makarov who told me, oh, it's actually very easy to do that. I've done it many times and I feel quite confident I can tell you how to do it. So with his help, we converted the, uh, our mass spec data into copy numbers detected per peptide and per protein. And we overlaid the distributions of copy number detected for a set of genes that were analyzed both at the protein and at the RNA level. And as you can see here, in the case of single cell RNA sequencing, for a vast number of genes, we detected relatively few copies and that corresponds with a large sampling error uh, that is <clears throat> well characterized in the community of single cell RNA sequencing and one of the main bottlenecks to generating more quantitative data. While in the case of uh, uh, scope two, we were able to sample larger number of copies, about 20 fold larger on, on average, and that results in less counting error due simply to the statistical sampling. Now, what else can we learn by looking at the two data sets together? Uh, from the very beginning, it, it, it was clear that there will be some genes that uh, change in a similar way between monocytes and macrophages at the RNA and protein level, and some that will change in a different way. 
So we conducted a correlation vector analysis that allowed us to identify this subset of genes. Essentially, we computed the correlation matrices of all pairwise correlations between all proteins and all RNAs. And for each gene, we computed the correlation between the corresponding correlation vectors. And this gives us a fairly broad distribution here that has one mode corresponding to genes with very similar correlation vectors and another uh, set of genes that have different correlation vectors between RNA and protein. And within each cluster, these genes show very, very highly coherent behavior. And indeed, when we visualize this set of genes uh, shown here to the right, we see that indeed there are over a thousand genes whose changes at the RNA and protein level is qualitatively similar. Quantitatively, it's obviously not exactly the same. And there is a set of hundreds of genes that show the exact opposite changes between monocytes and macrophages. And you can ask, what are these genes that change in a different way? Uh, here is one snapshot, one superficial depiction of what they are. They tend to be involved in GTPase um, uh, activation of various signaling pathways and other immune-related functions. The other type of analysis that we did in collaboration with Peter Kurchenko is to jointly project it, the RNA and the protein data sets into the same reduced dimensionality space. This analysis is frequently done with single cell RNA sequencing data. And we used an approach, CONUS, that has been developed for such single cell RNA sequencing data sets that we modified to also work with our scope to data. And the first thing that you can see here with the uh, cells analyzed by RNA sequencing in gray is that they form a broader spread compared to uh, the cells analyzed with scope two. And then of course, we were very interested in possible batch effects because we did multiple biological and technical replicates over the span of multiple months. And we wanted to know how much of our data is just a reflection of uh, artifacts. But, it, but looking at the batch effects and their uniform distribution across the joint projection, they appear to, uh, to, be, uh, to play a fairly insignificant role here. They, we have successfully corrected for them to, to whatever extent they existed. And similarly, by using the same marker genes, we are able to identify the different uh, clusters of cells, in this case, monocytes and macrophages. But they want to zoom a little bit more into this plot here. What's going on? Why are the single, why are the cells analyzed with 10x genomics more diffused? There are a number of possible uh, factors that might contribute to that. One is we analyzed larger number of cells with single cell RNA sequencing. Another is this joint projection only shows a subset of the variance in the data and shows it in some distorted convoluted way so that it creates this as an artifact. And we wanted to test that. And to test it, we simply computed the pairwise correlations between either single cell proteomes or single cell transcriptomes within a cell type. Meaning we computed the correlations, for example, between all macrophage-like macrophage cells analyzed either by 10x genomics or by scope two. And you can see that the correlations for the scope two data are substantially larger than the correlations for the single cell RNA sequencing data, which is suggesting in this case, we're using all of the genes that are quantified at both levels. We're using the same genes and, the, and using all of the data, not just the projection. So this is giving us much more direct evidence that there is less variability in the single cell protein data than there is in the single cell RNA data. And we don't yet know exactly why that is the case. What are the factors? This, this can be due to having less technical variability because we sample larger number of proteins, a larger number of copies from each protein. It is also likely due at least in part to protein levels being less variable across single cells because transcriptional noise tends to be averaged out at the level of the proteins. The results that they presented today have been, have come from a very collaborative team 
with many, many people contributing to them. And in particular, Harrison Specht uh, has led these projects very ably, um, along with the rest of, of my lab and collaborators outside of the lab, including Peter Krochenko's group and Alexander Frank's group at uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, UCSB accordingly. Uh, all of this work has been made possible by generous support by the NIH Director's Award, as well as support from Sanofi and Merck. But this is about our work, what I presented so far, and I would like to say a few words for the broader community and the trend that we see here. Starting with a group of 50 or so people who met um, two years ago for this first single cell proteomics meeting ever. And ever since, this community has had very bold dreams, and these dreams are beginning to stir a revolution uh, that is beginning to bear fruits, and all of this is very, very exciting. But it's not sufficient to really sustain the field, because to sustain it, we also need to have increasing amount of support. We need to have funding, and one of the really good trends that I begin to see increasingly is that funders are willing to embrace and support the development and application of single cell proteomics method, including very prestigious funders such as the Paul Allen Frontiers Group that uh, just recently named me a distinguished investigator and gave a considerable amount of resources to my group to develop methods for tracking proteome dynamics in single cells. But this is not about me and our project. I think the really exciting aspect here is that very prestigious visionary funders are willing to embrace the ideas of this community and recognize and support their potential. And in this case, it is the second time that Paul Allen Frontiers Group supports a mass spectrometry based project. And the fact that they've chosen a single cell proteomics project, I think is reflective of their enthusiasm for the kind of work that all of us are beginning to, to do and drive. And they're not alone. We are already funded as part of a PI group by Chan Zuckerberg. I was last year on a think tank at NIH articulating various projects that should be funded. And there are a couple of more think tanks coming organized both by NIH and HHMI uh, seeking ideas for single cell protein analysis projects that they should be funding to support us, to support the whole community, so that together we can realize the potential of this emerging field.